Good evening, everyone. Welcome to beautiful downtown Grand Forks. This is Grand Forks City Council's Committee of the Whole Work Session for August 8th, 2022, under item one, called to order 1.1. Welcome and roll call. Weigel? Here. Osowski? Here. Weber? Here. Lenski? Here. Kavami? Here. Sandy? Here. And Bean? We have a quorum. Ken, are you on? He's on. Okay. Yes, yes, I am. Right, Sorry. Thank you, Ken. Sure. Thank you. Under item two, discussion items, item 2.1, noise variance and letter of intent for commingling during North Dakota Museum of Art Welcome Back Festival. Ms. Simeone, good evening. Good evening, President uh, Sandy and members of the council. This is a an event, an annual event. This is their second year. Last year, they didn't do the individual concerts. They just did this wel welcome event. This year, the concerts have been returned, which we did earlier this summer. And this is a... Uh, a return of that other larger event. It's going to be um, partnered with, UN, of course it's um, sanctioned by UND, but it also will be, the co-mingling part will be by UND police. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Simeone? I'll move Mr. approval. Mr. Robert moves approval. Second. Second by Kavami. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Both same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Item 2.2, agreement between the City of Grand Forks and Grand Forks County for school nurse program using COVID-19 uh, funds and related budget amendments. Ms. Swanson, good evening. Good evening, President Sandy and members of the council. You have before you uh, two documents that are related to this. One is an agreement with Grand Forks County to provide school nurses to our rural schools. This is basically a, a continuation of a program that we've had for a couple years now, and it is funded with COVID funding. Uh, the reason I'm bringing the agreement forward is because the county had to rewrite it to change the dates, the dollar amount, and the source of funding, which is now ARPA funding instead of CARES funding. Um, additionally, there, it has been signed by the county, and uh, secondly, there is a budget amendment that reflects the $203,000 that will support the program through, next, through the next school year. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Ms. Swanson. Any questions? I have some questions. Yeah, Ms. Wasowski. Um, did these schools have nurses before COVID funding? Uh, Council Member Osowski, they did not. Uh, the county has long been uh, working with the rural schools to try to help them establish school nurse positions. And we have provided some very intermittent uh, services to those county schools, but not in the comprehensive way that we have been able to do with the COVID funding. Initially, the nurses worked uh, primarily on COVID response work, and now they've been able to transition some of that work to more health promotion, wellness activities, school screenings. Um, it does say that uh, along with the COVID that you guys address other health concerns with students. Can you tell me like what might be some of those other health concerns with students and also what goes into school wellness? Uh, Councilmember uh, Osowski, I'd be happy to address that. Some of the things that the school nurses do might be curriculum on health. Um, they do a fair amount of responding to student injuries that occur during the school day. Uh, they may teach uh, other school personnel about medication administration. That's been one of the biggest challenges for schools, is having qualified people to um, oversee medication administration for students. And wellness activities uh, primarily focus around nutrition, physical activity. Um, they also might do uh, vision screening and support some of that uh, health-related uh, services that are in place in those schools. Okay, um, I agree with having a nurse in schools. Uh, my fear is, though, is if we continue to take this COVID funding, that eventually the current administration who provides this funding and the unelected officials are going to eventually maybe force down that these nurses uh, push COVID propaganda, pharmaceuticals, and other controversial uh, health topics on the children so i just wanted to point that out or ask if like are they is there anything that has to be taught for us to receive this money to support the nurses uh, council member osowski there are no requirements by the county in terms of what they want to have provided mm -hmm. the schools this the nurses work very closely with the school administrators on what their needs are 
but what about the federal government and that administration, I guess, is the administration that I'm talking about. Um, you know, there is a big issue right now with schools receiving funding for the free lunch program. Um, it, but in order to receive that funding, they have to abide and teach certain curriculums in the school. There so no, that's what I'm kind sure. of wondering if that happens. There are no required curriculums. The funding is flexible because of the fact that it's ARPA funding. And while it is federal funding, it came to the state. The state allocated it to the cities and the counties. And they had a fair amount of flexibility in how they applied that funding. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Weber? Yes, uh, Ms. Swanson, um, the, the, I, I believe the state of North Dakota is somewhat unique in relation to school nurses. Um, do most states uh, uh, provide for, for nurses in, in all the school districts? Uh, Council Member Weber, uh, there's a wide variety of how school nursing is provided across the nation, but North Dakota is one of the states where there is not designated funding from the state for school nurses or a designated school nursing program. Um, we have a patchwork of ways that we try to address the needs of students in schools, and it might be school district funding, it may be combination of public health funding. There's no state funding provided at all and no federal funding. Th thanks for program. thanks for this work then um, I'll, I'll move approval please there's a motion by Weber is there a second by Weigel thank you mr. Weigel uh, Ms. Swanson so oh yes mr. Phelan come uh, council president Sandy I think to mr. Weber's comment I know in the last session we did try to work with uh, our state legislators to get school nursing funding um, throughout the state to include grant. Otherwise, what happens is it's zero sum. If Grand Forks has school nurses, that's taking away from funding that we already have to really push, if it's a good idea to have the state um, step up their funding um, for sc school nursing, so we're not taking away from other academic programs. So that might be a, an item that, as the chair of the legislative committee, we wanna, may want to bring up to the, as part of a priority. In fact, wasn't it one of our priorities last it session? Yeah. It was. Uh, so we'll need to be uh, reviewing those again, uh, probably in November when that comes up. But at this time, what you're asking for is uh, consistent with the priorities that have already been approved by this body. Right. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And so, so Ms. Swanson, do you know, um, and I'm, I fully support this, and I think that all school districts should have school nurses. Um, do you know what, are there other districts in our surrounding area that maybe aren't in Grand Forks County? Are there other districts that don't have school nurses that aren't getting the support that maybe we're providing to Manville and Laramore and so on? President Sandy, uh, as I mentioned before, there's a huge variety in how school nursing services are delivered. There are a few districts, primarily in the larger communities, where the district pays for school nurses. And a lot of that is driven by students with special needs that have um, a need for nurses to take care of them during the school day. And then uh, secondly, in the rural, more rural areas, as I mentioned before, it's often a public health department responsibility because they include all of the residents of the county in their service area. We've done that intermittently for as long as I've been with the Grand Forks Public Health Department, which is 35 years plus. Um, and this was just an opportunity to enhance what we were doing. Great, thank you. It's very important work for our, for our younger people. Any other comments or thoughts? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Adam. 2.3, create districts for project 8559, 8560, 8561, 62, and 60, 63. Districts 591, 356, 592, 767, and 593. Sanitary, water, main, storm, paving streets for the southern estates. Ninth. What does PH stand for in this case? PH2 and South 30th Street, Box Culvert, and South End Drainway. What does PH stand for? <laughs> good, good evening, Thank President you. Sandy. Mr. Phase 2. Phase 2. Phase two. Uh, good evening, President Sandy, committee members. Uh, this uh, is infill development. It's our next round of um, uh, building. Uh, this differs because we're not growing at the southern end of uh, Grand Forks. We're just filling in uh, a gap in the southern estate's ninth uh, subdivision. So we've been working with the developer, uh, Guy Useldinger, and um, 
the we agree the timing was right to request um, that the utilities paving um, street lights and a crossing of the south end drainway be installed um, in conjunction with a another uh, portion of the development that he's working privately so the timing was right um, this uh, project uh, will cost roughly 2.5 million dollars to construct the um, the next staff report that you'll be presented is the engineers agreement uh, task order with Houston engineering that goes along with this project um, so with that uh, we are uh, oh, excuse me I skipped over a good uh, important point uh, all costs will be special assessed uh, to the benefiting properties except for a city cost share on the crossing uh, the culvert crossing in the south end drainway by policy the city uh, pays for 50 percent of that um, that was not a budget item for this year uh, this development kind of happened quickly but we are able to cover that in fund 4815 and request a budget amendment to use cash carryover for uh, roughly two hundred seventy thousand dollars for the city share uh, so with that uh, engineering is requesting um, creation of the assessment districts uh, approval of the engineers report and uh, direction to prepare plans and specifications thank you mr lieberman any yes mr weber we have approval moved by weber second by weigel any other comments Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Motion carries unanimously. I won't make that same mistake again, Mr. Lieberman. Engine 2 4 engineering agreement for project 8559, 60, 61, 2, 63, District 591, 356, 592, 767, 593. Sanitary, water, main, storm, paving, street lights for Southern Estates, ninth phase two. No, yeah, phase two. I'm seeing double. South 30th Street, Box Culvert, and Southern Drainway. Sure. Uh, thank you, President Sandy. As I mentioned, uh, we're re recommending uh, an engineering task order for design and construction inspection with Houston Engineering. Uh, that's estimated at $306,000, which is, uh, given the size of this project, is right in line with what we expect for those services. So we recommend approval of that task order. Great. There's a uh, Mr. Weigel moves approval. Is there a second? Second by Lunsky. Any comments or questions? I have a question. Mr. Lieberman, next time, can we combine two and three together? Do we have to read those separately? Is there any reason why we can't create the districts and approve the engineering agreement in the same? We absolutely can, President. That, that would be great. I think that would make perfect sense. Anyone have any problems with that? Questions? OK. All those in, figure, in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Post aye. Same, post same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Thank Lieberman. You. Item 2.5. Federal funding request for 42nd Street Rail Grade Separation Crossing, City Project 8540. Mr. Krenko, good evening. Good evening, President Sandy and members of the committee. Um, we have a fair amount of history on this 42nd Street Grade Separated Project. We've been working on this project since uh, about uh, 2004 at least. And uh, recently, we uh, ended up hiring a consultant to work on our environmental document, which we're hoping to have completed by the end of this year. A couple of week, about a week and a half ago or so, I was received communication from the North Dakota Department of Transportation that they had received communication from Burlington Northern, indicating that Burlington Northern saw this particular grade separation, grade separated project as one of their highest priorities in North Dakota, and not only that, but they were interested in writing grant. Uh, application for a multitude of federal grant opportunities out there and we're interested to hear from the North Dakota Department of Transportation if they were interested in having a cost share on it as well as if the city was going to have an interest in uh, cost share on this project right now uh, BNSF is willing to bring their consultant on board for that grant writing and they're looking at three different programs that would uh, be eligible for or this program or project would be eligible for program funding on. First one is uh, Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements, or CRISI. Uh, this is one that currently is not yet out for solicitation, but uh, last year when it came out, there was about uh, 370 million available uh, nationally, and it had a application deadline by about the end of November. Um, that one had a funding, uh, federal funding allocation of up to 80% but it provided uh, preference for projects with a federal share of 50% of less. 
Second program is the Railroad Crossing Elimination Program. Now this one uh, has about 570 million available roughly. And uh, this one has an application deadline of about October 4th of this year. So it's coming up pretty quick, less than uh, two months. And the third one is Reconnecting Communities Grant Program. This one has about 145 million available. Uh, and this has a application deadline of October 13th. Overall, um, two out of those three programs have a fairly short turnaround time. We're talking about two months which is a fairly short window to get applications put together and submitted. Uh, BNSF is interested in working with not only the DOT, but also with us in putting together those applications. Um, overall, they are anticipating with the various cost shares that are available in these various programs that uh, they're estimating that they'll be able to get 50% federal funding and they are not uh, currently 100% sure as to what they would be willing to put forward. They're currently doing their calculations to see what uh, their cost share would be. Um, and same with the North Dakota Department of Transportation. Uh, since we don't currently know what uh, cost share the BNSF or NDDOT are willing to put forward, um, kind of a rough estimate that I can kind of foresee would be somewhere between a 20% city cost share and upwards, but hopefully not 50% uh, uh, cost share, which would be roughly somewhere between 10 million and 33 million, since right now our estimated project costs are between 50 million and I believe 66 million roughly. Um, so it is a, a fairly big range. Uh, I was, I'm hopeful that uh, between Committee of the Whole tonight and City Council next week, Monday, that I might be able to get some additional information from BNSF and the North Dakota Department of Transportation as to what uh, their anticipated cost share would be. And if I do get that uh, here this week, I'll end up updating the staff report before it uh, would go to council next Monday. Um, so with that, uh, we're recommending that uh, we provide a letter of support to the DOT and BNSF to continue moving forward on applying for these different grant programs and uh, see if we can't get this project off the ground. Thank you, Mr. Krenko. Questions or comments, Mr. Kavami? Move approval. Ms. Kavami moves approval. Ms. Wasowski, is that a second? Yes. Thank you. Do you have any comments? I have a question, Mr. Krenko. Um, I know that we've been talking with Burlington Northern about this project for quite some time. Um, in the past, they've said that they don't have a whole lot of money set aside for projects like this. So I believe, and, and Mr. Grasser has better history, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we ever expected that they were going to be coming in with $30 million to help us on this. We were hoping that they'd bring in millions, but maybe two or whatever, right? Um, so let's, let's assume Burlington Northern was out and they weren't going to come in with any money at all. What is the typical amount of money the state would cover on this sort of a project? Um, like what percentage of the funding would the state cover? Council President Sandy, on um, something like this, a lot of times um, they may have a city, or they may have a state share because of the adjacent state highway, which is Demers Avenue, for those of you who do not know, is State Highway 297. Um, so they may have a share related to that. Um, what NEDOT is currently looking at using for federal funding to or state funding to match this is funding that they have available to match other grant programs. Um, so I'm not, it's, it's a different pot of money that they can use. Um, otherwise, if it is... But on a, a typical project like this across the state, what has the state been funding with federal and state dollars? About what percentage? If it's a secondary regional road, which I believe Demers Avenue is, it would sometimes be, I believe, a 80% federal, 10% state, 10% local. Sure. And so if they're going to apply and get a grant for 50% of whatever this project is, that leaves the other 50% that we're trying to cover through the state of North Dakota. Shouldn't we be paying 5% of that? Or maybe 10% at maximum if, if the state is typically covering 80-20 or 80-10-10? Different funding programs have different available allocations. And so it's, it's really tough to say how... Sure, I understand. But I, I guess my point is that just because we're getting a grant from the feds, this is extra money that, th that is outside of the state money that the state has from the feds. So I, I would hope that they wouldn't be penalizing us for getting that money. In my opinion, they should be, you know, helping us even 
at least at the same funding percentage that they've done for other communities for whatever the local share is going to be. But of course, that's just my opinion. Mr. Phelan? We are, we do, uh, Council President Sandy, we do have a meeting with uh, North Dakota DOT <clears throat> to not only talk about this particular project, also talk about the interchange and, and some improvements we need to make along Highway 2 and, and 81. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. I think this is really uh, a lot of good news. And um, I, would, I would presume that um, we need to push PNSF, this is in their best interest to do, that we should assume at least a, at the very least a 5% cost share, if not uh, something substantially greater than that. And so we'll, we'll push this as a needed project. I think the other thing we're going to really push, um, and David's a really nice guy and he wants to maintain relationships with, um, with the DOT too, so he's a strategic that way too. But I think we should really push the fact that we've been funding these environmental documents which I think is unique and different. So we've expressed our interest in this by funding it with our own monies. And I think that's gonna be part of our, it's so important for us as we've been doing this over and over. We haven't gone to them to say, hey, we're gonna help make the sh help us make the shovel um, project, or the project shovel ready. We've been doing that with our own funds. So um, with your encouragement, uh, Council President Sandy and City Council, we'll, we'll push on the DOT that this is a really important, uh, project uh, for our city council and and we'd really uh, appreciate a, a a really good cost here so if you want to make that as part of the motion we'll carry that on to Bismarck yeah I, I think that goes without saying mr. Phelan I, I, I agree I think uh, uh, for as much money as I've spent on gas sitting out on on Demers Avenue and 42nd Street waiting for the train to go by BNSF should pick up the tab for the entire local share but again that's just my opinion any other comments or thoughts Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. same sign. Thank you, Mr. Bean. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Krako. Good work. This is really exciting news. Item 2.6, bid award. Uh, bid number 2022-12, 2022-13, and 2022-15. Rock sale for ice control, wash sand, and contingent snow hauling. Ms. Lipsch, good evening. Good evening, President Sandy, council members. Um, I have bids for you for Streets Division. Um, the first one is for Rock Salt. We received two bids, one from Blackstrap Incorporated and one from NSC Minerals. Blackstrap Incorporated did not meet many of our bid specifications, so we would like to award to NSC Minerals in the amount of $123.13 per ton. Would you like me to go through all of them? Okay. Um, the, the next one is for wash sand. We received two bids for wash sand for ice control. Gowan Construction was $27.75 per ton. Strata Corporation was $19.86 per ton. We are requesting that you award to Strata Corporation. Low bid. The next item is contingent snow hauling for the streets division. We received one bid from Gowan Construction in the amount of $87,600. How does that 87000 compare to last year's? It was very close, President Great. Sandy, sorry. Um, and when you look at the, the um, bid tabulation, we only pay for the items we use, so we won't ever get a bill for $87,600. It's Great. just how, how the city um, bids it out. Sure. So we'll only pay for what we use when we use it. Thank you. Any, any Mr. Weber? I'll move approval of staff recommendations move, on all three items. Moved by Weber. Is there a second? Second by Wasowski. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And uh, item 2.7, public works surplus equipment. In the staff report, I provided a list of surplus equipment from the streets division, um, sanitation division, and central garage division at public works facility. We are requesting permission to list these on gov deals. I was surprised to see that we had so much equipment from the 60s still on hand. Um, there is one correction. I did not have the year of the tandem truck with the poly box. That is in 1995. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Phelan, uh, city administration is on board with the, the surplus equipment. Yep, and I, I think, uh, number one, you should always know with Public Works people, they always want to back up to the back up to the back up, mm -hmm. and you should, so you should really feel uh, good about your what they want to do to make sure they never let you and the citizens of Grand Forks down, so I'm glad that you edited out 
Uh, there are some back rats out there. The only one note I would say, um, we are surplusing our, our balers, and as you rem remember, we went to a loose fill operation with some alternative daily covers, so we are, we are um, s um, providing those as surplus. So that's a nice move. I think that's a good move for uh, what we're doing with our operations, too. So that was the only uh, specific note I want to mention to you. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Any comments? Mr. Weigel, moves Move approval. approval. Is there a second? By Kavami, any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Lipsch. Item 2.8, City Meeting Management Discussion. Mr. Grostick. Um, I'm going to allow uh, Mr. Quinn to uh, present since he did uh, certainly bring or on the memorandum. Great. Mr. Quinn, good evening. Good evening, President Sandy, other members of the Committee of the Whole. Um, if you had an opportunity to read the uh, staff report and the memorandum that I provided, you're going to recognize this is going to focus mostly on the First Amendment. Anything that has to do with meeting control focuses on First Amendment rights, what the city can and cannot restrict, um, and what, a, what the public has a right to do and say. Um, it, I apologize, it's going to seem kind of like a civics lesson. Um, you have to go through all of it to understand um, the options that the city has. Uh, the First Amendment protects four basic rights, one of which is the freedom of speech. It's pretty universally known that that's protected, um, but what's not understood is the scope and application of that right. The First Amendment recognizes the importance of uninhibited, robust, and wide open public debates. It does not include caustic personal attacks, fighting words, or speech that rises to the level of disruptive conduct. According to the United States Supreme Court, the First Amendment does not guarantee the right of an individual to communicate their views at all times to anyone that they want. Um, to this end, the Supreme Court recognizes different types of forms. The purposes of, uh, for purposes of this discussion, two of the forms are going to be combined. Um, first, you have traditional public forms. Those are uh, public streets, your town square, parks. These are places that have been uh, long held by tradition and the government uh, and by government fiat to be devoted to assembly and to free speech. Uh, the opposite end of the spectrum is non-public forms. This is uh, public property that's not open to public communication, either by tradition or designation. Uh, examples of this would be uh, public schools, uh, municipal court, city offices. In between, you have what's called designated limited public forums. These are areas that are opened for public discussion by the government. Um, they're used, they're open for public at large for assembly and speech, for certain types of speakers, or for dis discussions on certain types of um, topics. They're opened for a limited period of time, for a limited topic, and for a limited class of speakers. Um, an example of that is this room during city council meetings, um, during the either uh, citizen comment period or at public hearings. Um, these areas are generally not open for public expression, kind of like today at the city or at the committee of the whole. There is no public comment, there is no public hearing, the public does not have a right uh, to speak. They're, um, they're only open for public expression at the um, designation of the City Council. Um, the City does not have to create these designated limited public forums, but when they do, any restrictions on speech has to be narrowly tailored to serve a specific government, a specific legitimate government interest. Um, as a designated public forum, um, public hearing and citizen comment periods are subject to these reasonable content neutral time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, content neutral means that the restriction is justified without reference to the speech. Um, they provide, and they provide alternate, altern alternate um, means of uh, channels of communication, like emails, uh, meeting with public officials, um, telephone calls. These restrictions, uh, restrictions are considered content neutral even if they have an in incidental effect on silencing somebody um, some speaker or message, even though that's not the intent of it. Um, examples would be limiting comments to only agenda items for citizen comments, or having a residency requirement, 
or not permitting um, citizen comments to include uh, personal attacks or complaints about public employees. Um, time restrictions, example of this is that three minute time um, that citizen comments are asked to be uh, maintained uh, for. These are permitted because they're uh, considered a means of conserving time and ensuring that everybody has the right to talk. If there is no time limit, somebody could get up here, filibuster, read the phone book or a dictionary, and kind of prevent any other, anybody else who attended a meeting um, from talking because they take up the whole time. Place restrictions, um, a good example of this is speaking at the podium, not allowing individuals in the gallery from shouting or during the citizen comment period, making individuals come up to the podium so that they can be heard by everybody that are, that's here. Um, manner restrictions, a good example of that is non-disruptive comment uh, or speech uh, that disrupts government business. Um, Content neutral time, place, manner restrictions are permitted because they um, further the government interest, being the orderly, efficient, effective, uh, dignified public meetings. Um, the law requires city council meetings, uh, the law recognizes, sorry, that city council meetings are just that. They're a government process for a government purpose. Um, the First Amendment does not grant individuals the right to be heard by a public body making decisions. It is the public body that gives them the right to be heard at their meetings. Um, the Supreme Court recognizes this, um, that allowing anybody, any interested member of the public, any opportunity to present testimony before decisions made at any time they want would completely upend existing government, government practice. Simply put, the First Amendment protects freedom of speech. It doesn't grant an individual the right to speak whenever or wherever they want. Um, again, uh, restrictions have to be content neutral. They have to have uh, end time, place, manner uh, justifications. They cannot, um, the city council cannot restrict things, uh, broad categories of speech like offensive speech um, because that cate categorization, sorry, is, uh, is too broad to be enforced and it's um, subjective in nature. So it, it'll lean towards more the content restrictions. Um, but disruptive and disrespectful speech and disruptive conduct is considerable, is considered reasonable content neutral restrictions that further legitimate government business. Um, as this ties into North Dakota's open meeting laws, North Dakota law state that except, except as otherwise specifically provided by law, all meetings of public entities must be open to the public. But the Attorney General has weighed in on this and said that open meetings does not mean that people have the right to participate in the open meetings. And then finally, um, with the right to um, enact content neutral time, place, manner restrictions, you have the right to enforce those restrictions. So how this applies then to city council meetings is that the city council meetings, um, the public hearings, and the citizen comment periods are limited public forums um, that the public has a protected liberty interest in um, attending and providing comment. However, the mayor and the city council may implement procedures or policies and reg regulations that further the important government interest of conducting city business. They're limited, again, to content neutral time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, I want to make clear, though, that even without any policies, the presiding officer, whether it be uh, the president, uh, the city council, or the mayor, they have the right to enforce uh, conduct to ensure the orderly, efficient, effective, and dignified public meetings. Um, controlling a meeting and enforcing rules of decorum does not require implementation of a procedure. However, by implementing a procedure, it provides two, um, it, it serves two dual, dual purposes. One, it provides guidelines to the presiding officer as to what is considered disruptive conduct. And it also provides citizens a guideline of what is expected during their attendance. Um, I need to stress the Im importance of implementation. Um, if there is a policy, um, it is better to be strictly enforced than to have um, lax enforcement. Because what, it'll, what would end up happening is it can be argued that if you let a speaker speak for more than three minutes, but then cut off another speaker, that cutting off that other speaker is content restrictions on what that individual is saying, not because it's repetitive. Um, 
there can be exceptions um, at times depending on the topics and this can be made on a case-by-case -case basis but any exceptions have to be made um, for the benefit of for the favor of all speech either for or against um, and then while pro procedures policy and regulations prohibit prohibit abusive and offensive speech um, wait sorry while procedure policy regulations that prohibit abusive and offensive speech are not recommended um, disruptive speech oh sorry is permissible um, I don't want to be too repetitive here. I do want to point out too that it's not enough for objectionable speech to be obnoxious, annoying, or even disrespectful because offensive speech is protected by the First Amendment. It does have to rise to the level of disruptive conduct. And while single out word outbursts may not rise to the level of disruptive conduct, repeated single word outbursts do. Um, so would continued outbursts such as yelling uh, from the gallery or individuals speaking over the, uh, the presenter or interruptions um, that prevent the presentation of the city council from continuing um, the presentation or discussion of agenda items. Um, another one would be refusing to relinquish the podium um, at the end of your time or preventing others from um, exercising their right to speech. Um, I did provide an example with my memorandum this was basically gleaned from other cities uh, throughout north dakota i looked at what their restrictions were i would like to point out that uh, grand forks has one of the most liberal citizen comment periods um, essentially the only restriction that there is is that there is a three minute um, time limit some other cities and i can't remember exactly which one it was they have uh, removed all citizen comments um, during city council meetings um, and this was recently basically because of repeated repeated abuses and refusal to follow guidelines um, I'm not suggesting that the city do that but I am just pointing that out um, so that the city aware is aware that there are cities out there that don't allow public comments and that um, it is reasonable to provide restrictions to maintain order um, and to ensure that everybody has the right uh, to comment uh, with that, um, I'd stand for any questions. So uh, thank you, Mr. Quinn, for that. I think it uh, should be noted that there were, were occasions where there have been outbursts and uh, people refusing to leave the podium. So um, I had requested the city attorney, as well as I think others, look into well, what are our what are we required to do and what are our options for maintaining public order in our uh, in our council meetings so I'll, I'll own up to that I was asking the questions and so um, I appreciate Mr. Quinn doing some diligence here putting together some some thought process I do I'll open this up for discussion I think the first thing that I'll say is just because I asked for this doesn't mean I want to limit public con uh, or at least uh, eliminate public comment because I certainly don't want to I think it's one of the best things that we do in our co community is give people the opportunity to speak but I I was interested and I'm still interested in having the conversation about how people feel about the way the meetings have been going and if we as a body think that we should make any changes to how the meetings are being run um, because uh, occasionally myself and sometimes the mayor have been putting into positions where it's been difficult for us to to manage city business so I'll, I'll open it up to thoughts or if anyone has any any questions or comments for Mr. Quinn. Otherwise, we can just have a general discussion as well about our thoughts about how the meetings have been going. I think, again, the, the reason for this discussion today is in my 12 years on the council, we've had lots of issues that have had considerable public debate, but I've never seen the behavior that I've been seeing related to the corn mill that we're trying to put in in our community. I've never seen people traveling from far and wide to come here and to yell at us. I've never seen people on social media saying that they should get uh, get a rope for the council president and or uh, as soon as they get out of prison, they, they want the addresses for the council members so that they can go take care of them. I've never seen that before. 
I'm seeing it now, and so I'm concerned about the safety of all the council members. I'm concerned about the safety of the people here in the audience. I'm concerned about my family's safety, to be honest with you. And so I thought, again, having the discussion tonight about, you know, how are, how are things going, and um, I think uh, prov guidance that the council can provide to help the mayor and myself manage the meetings, I think it, we both appreciate how people feel about how we should move things forward. So I don't know if anyone is interested. Mr. Weber, yes, sir. Um, the, the most common remarks that I'm currently hearing from people when I'm at the grocery store or, or in my neighborhood um, is alarm about the, uh, the tone that these meetings have taken on. Uh, people are uh, distressed by the, the behavior. They feel that this is inconsistent with our, our community's uh, values and culture. Um, let me... Uh, at the risk of being repetitive, uh, Mr. Quinn, you said that we have one of North Dakota's least restrictive policies related to public input. Is that a, a fair paraphrase? Yes, sir. So we have one of the most open and transparent processes for public input in the state. That's correct, Council Member Weber. It's been suggested that we're quite the opposite of that, so I, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. And uh, when I say it's been suggested, I mean in some of the comments that I've heard in this room. And and Please, Council Member Weber, I can expand on that. There are um, city councils that the citizen comment period is um, limited to agenda items. There are uh, councils that require uh, citizen comments to fill out either an application card or online um, by noon on Monday. Um, so my understanding is the citizen comment period here has no limitations as to the scope of agenda item and individuals as long as they get that uh, comment card filled out prior to the meeting and get it into the hands of the city official <coughs> even I've seen while watching these meetings sometimes during the meetings it'll sure. get passed along um, so while the city does have those there it's pretty liberal and compared to what the other cities are providing thanks thanks and uh, actually I hope that we will do everything we can to preserve that. Um, I have no interest in becoming, uh, you know, the most restrictive city in the state. We'll leave that to, to some other community. I like being uh, the most open, uh, having the, the most open, transparent process for public input. Unfortunately, uh, abuses of our, our, our current system have brought us to this point where we're having this discussion tonight. And, and thank you, President Sandy, for, uh, for making this request and bringing it forward. Uh, in that spirit, um, you, you've given us a, 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 a civics lesson on, on the First Amendment. Um, at what point is someone You've mentioned that uh, it's perfectly, that, that insults are, are protected free, free, free speech. Correct. Right? Uh, at what point is someone accusing council members of being traitors to national security a reasonable insult versus disruptive behavior? Um, so uh, the, the definition for disruptive speech that rises to the level of disruptive conduct has, um, has that hook that even disruptive speech is protected. It's the disruptive conduct that's not. So once that speech rises to the level of impeding government business, where um, a good, a good um, example of that is when, um, I think it was two meetings ago, where there was individuals in the gallery who were talking over people who were presenting. Um, they were saying things like, they're lying, I've got the truth, and then continue on stopping the presentation. That is disruptive conduct because that's actually stopping the flow of government um, of the government meeting. And um, what about free speech over social media? That so that's that's a tough one in that um, there's not a whole lot of law on that one, um, but it's it's generally um, considered the content neutral time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, so it's all or none. You can take comments away, but you cannot erase an individual's comments. You can't say, I don't like this comment, so I'm going to erase it and leave everybody else's comment. You can remove the ability to comment, but you can't single out an individual comment or an individual positive or negative comment. Right. And, and in our 
uh, contemporary society, social media has become an important way for, um, it, it's become the town square in, in many ways. And I, I'd hate to see us um, do, do too much to that, but um, there have been these, uh, you know, kind of uh, accusations that we're currently monkeying with the sound system, for instance, uh, when we have uh, an invited uh, invited testimony and someone has a bad speak, uh, microphone or something. Uh, so that, that one's going to be, it's tough to define and it's going to be very tough for us to, to wrestle with. Um, what about what about signs? Um, I'd imagine that signs are a completely legitimate uh, form of uh, freedom of speech, but at some point, they they too can become disruptive. Uh, that would be correct, Councilmember Weber. Um, so signs are protected uh, speech, but the moment that that sign inhibits somebody else from either attending a public meeting, either viewing it, or um, is disruptive to the meeting. Um, then that would that would rise to the level of disruptive comment. And basically, um, what I'm saying is that I can't stand up in the front row and have an uh, eight by twelve sign blocking everybody from behind me's ability to see. Right. You know, I'm I'm making it an extreme just to to, to illustrate the. It's you have to be blocking somebody else's right. Once you are infringing on somebody else's right, then your speech is no longer protected. It's kind of like you can swing your arm around as much as you want, but the moment that makes contact with somebody else, you don't have that right. And uh, you've made an important point that once we make, come to some sort of decision about these standards, uh, we then have to enforce them uh, quite strictly because we can't allow one person to go over for one minute over, another person two minutes over, and then stop someone when they go 20 minutes over. There, there's a line and we have to respect our own line. Correct. The purpose of, uh, of a policy like this would be is, um, objective standards for um, government or governance of the meeting. Um, there is the ability to have exceptions. Um, say if you were on a topic, public hearing where you wanted, you know, instead of three minutes, you wanted to give everybody <coughs> eight minutes. You could do that. Um, you can't have, for instance, a public hearing and say, you get five minutes, you get eight minutes, you get five minutes. Um, it has to be, exceptions have to be exercised on the side of freedom of speech. And yet you, you've spoken over our three minute limit. So um, it seems that there are maybe three kinds of uh, speech involved here other than what comes from the council members themselves. We have citizen comments, we have public hearings, and we have invited testimony. And it's reasonable to set uh, different standards for all three or how would that play out? Correct. Um, so in speaking here right now, I'm not exercising my First Amendment right to speak. I am um, providing information that has been requested of me from the City Council. So it's, that's a different, different contact as far as speech. And, and um, citizen comments and uh, a comment during a public hearing, uh, would, we want, would we need to have the same standards for both or could we set separate standards for those? I, w I would think that for, um, for a public hearing and citizen comment, they serve two different governmental purposes, so it would be acceptable to have two different um, policies if that's something that the city council or the uh, mayor or presiding officer would want. Sure, because public hearing is going to be very agenda uh, specific. We have an item on the agenda, we open a public hearing, we request people to, if they have any input on that issue. Um, uh, citizen comments, on the other hand, are, are just people can stand up and use their three minutes in any way they wish, right? Correct. Um, how do we determine when someone is speaking during a public hearing uh, whether or not it actually is relevant to that agenda item? That is more, that would be a, the presiding officer's call as to um, the scope of somebody talking at a, at a public hearing as to whether that's on topic for that public hearing, for that agenda item. Very good. So um, for now, I'd just like to conclude that um, we have one of the most open processes in the state at this time. Um, 
I'm, I'm hoping that we will uh, maintain that uh, level of openness, but we also have to recognize that our current processes have uh, been abused to the point that, uh, I don't know about everyone else, but I hear about this regularly from strangers on the street will come up to me and, and mention this. So we need uh, at this point to uh, have this discussion. It's good that we're having it. Um, uh, hopefully we would uh, come up with some guidelines and then then we're stuck with having to enforce those in a, in a fairly strict fashion. Because that's the way the process is going to have to work, isn't it? Uh, Council Member Weber, that's correct. Otherwise, you, the city subjects itself to constitutional challenges uh, as to a selective enforcement. Yeah, it's unfortunate that it's come to this, but uh, thanks. Thanks for the information. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Are there other comments? Yes, Ms. Lonsky. Um, so my first meeting, there was a gentleman from the other side of the state who came and he said, if you don't get rid of the corn mill processing, we'll take you out or we'll get rid of you. He, I can't remember exactly what he said. Um, he's obviously not going to vote for us because he doesn't live in Grand Forks, so uh, leaves it open to how he's going to take us out. And personally, that was very disturbing to me. Um, do we want to keep it to Grand Forks residents? Um, I saw that in your notes. It's uh, Council Member Lenski, um, that is an option, that is a policy option for uh, the mayor and the city council. Um, I would note that the guidance, I would, or I think I, would, I labeled it guidance at the end, that wasn't um, a recommendation so much as a, these are the restrictions that federal courts across the country have found to be constitutional. Um, so things like the time requirement, the residency requirement, the, um, all of those are things that um, have been deemed to be constitutional, so they are available options. I just wanted to make sure that the, the council and the mayor was aware of all of the available options. And then to the degree um, that you want to exercise those options, that's up to, that's policy decision. Could I, t I'm, I don't mean to step on your toes, I want to interject a thought on that. So, Mr. Quinn, um, let's say the City Council decided today um, that we want to limit uh, public comment to the City of Grand Forks and perhaps the extraterritorial in case we're um, planning on annexing, those people should be heard as well. Um, could we also then say, but anyone else that's not within the extraterritorial or city, if they submit comments by noon on Monday in writing, they can be read. Do we have the flexibility to say we, we can segregate this group versus that group? That one I'm not sure on. That's the, the cases that I read on that question, it was just a resident or not. Um, sure. So I'd have to, to look deeper into that question. Okay. Ms. Lonsky, do you have further comment? So, um, okay, well, let's skip that whole, well, we can come back to whether we think we should um, have just citizens commenting or not. Are there other items or thoughts people want to discuss? Mr. Kavami? Yeah, I, I think just if we do decide to implement a, a time, I do think that we need some consistency, consistency there. So either we don't or we do, but if we do, you know, I, I've been in many council meetings for other cities or commission meetings and they've had timers on the wall or wherever and that's unsightly. I think right now we're using our cell phones. Cell phones. You know, I've been at one where there's a timer and the timer goes off, the microphone turns off. And it's not a personal thing, it's just what I hate is the personal aspect that we have to deal with right now and I, I just would like consistency so that everyone's treated equally. So either we do it or we don't, but if we do, I think we need to change the mechanism from something that we're controlling here. It needs to just be an automated thing so that everybody's treated equally. Sure, are, are there others that believe that we should uh, do you think Mr. Kwame's on the right track? Yes, Mr. Weber? Well, if, if we do come up with a mechanism, uh, and, and I, I, I suspect that we're going to have to come up with something like that. Um, the, the timer goes off. The person's time is done. We've seen uh, time and time again uh, a lack of respect for any decorum in relation to something like that. And further, I suspect that we've had some individuals who have attended who are hoping to, um, to be uh, removed so that they can get on the front page of the paper, make a name for themselves in some way. How, how do we address 
when someone refuses to um, con conform to the rules. Uh, Council Member Weber, so if, if somebody, that's one of those um, disruptive comment, conduct situations. When somebody goes over their time and refuses to relinquish the podium, they're doing one of two things. They're not abiding by the time restriction, and they're also preventing somebody else from coming to the podium to speak. Um, at that point, when you have disruptive conduct, they can be removed from the meeting. Um, there's a couple different things that I've seen um, played out where um, the police were asked to escort the individual. Um, the other was, uh, like Mr. Er, uh, Council Member Kavami said, shut the microphones off. Um, that in this situation might not work because everybody can still hear clearly what the individual is saying. Um, but there's nothing that says the city council or the committee as a whole uh, couldn't recess the meeting, um, shut the microphone, the video feed off, um, and then just wait until that individual decided to uh, move on. They can exit the council chambers, they can stay in their chairs, they can do whatever they want um, during that recess, but it, it can be recessed until order is uh, brought back to the... To the so, um, Mr. Feeland, if, um, whether it's President Sandy or Mayor Pachensky, we, we run into a situation and, and they call for the, the meeting to be going to recess. Is it possible for us, uh, from a technical aspect, to, to shut things down and, and just put up the word recess, re recess on the screen for, for those attending at home? Yep. Council President Sandy and Council Member Webb, Vice President Weber, it is. It's similar to when we go into executive session and we come back out. We do a similar thing, and I think what we need, I, John's working back there tonight, but we just have to have our folks running the systems be ready for that and have things queued up. But yeah, I think it'd be similar to an executive session and then coming back out of it. Again, we have the least restrictive policies in the state right now about this. And it's, it's a shame that we're having to have this discussion, but this is the point we've been brought to. Thanks. Mr. Kavami. And, and it, the three minutes is arbitrary, right? I think it could be three minutes, it could be four minutes, it could be five minutes. That's, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I think uh, I, I have no interest in seeing anyone being hauled out of City Hall by the police. So I don't think under any circumstances I'm going to be okay with that. So as, as long as other council members don't have an issue with it, I think if, if I'm in a situation where somebody won't relinquish the podium, I'm going to call for a recess and take a break until things, order can be restored and we can come back, un unless people have strong feelings otherwise. Uh, from my perspective, that, that's like the, the one thing that I think we, I, I'd be ready to agree to right now is that uh, if we have disruptive behavior, uh, we go into immediate recess. Uh, of course, disruptive behavior is always going to be somewhat subjective, but that's the, the charge, the responsibility of the person running the meeting at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think um, if, if that's the case, then I think to Mr. Kavami's point, we should set a time and we should stick to the time. And, and uh, I don't know what that is. Three minutes isn't very long. It just, it isn't. Um, ten minutes is too long. I don't know what the right, what the right time amount to grant for people to speak. Um, if, if the committee believes it should be three minutes, I will go along with that. I, I do know that there are occasions when it's hard to get what you're, what you're getting at out in three minutes. So, I don't know. I'm uh, <coughs> Mr. Reed. Yeah, quick question. Um, is it possible for anybody to relinquish their time to somebody else, or are we going to establish it just for the person who's speaking? Is I that, believe that's up to the council. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a procedural uh, option for the council, or procedural decision for the council. Yeah, and I don't think we've had that happen, but I mean, I could envision that has happened in other, or in other uh, meetings. Uh, that we would at least want to address that too. President Sandy, could I? Yeah, Mr. Jones, Mayor. Yes, sir. But we'd all, what we're all looking for is we want, we want the back and forth. We want the discourse. We want it to be respectful. Um, I think what we're hearing is three minutes isn't enough. Why don't we 
Um, expand that up to five minutes and, and be firm on that five minutes. I think one other thing that could be helpful is, you know, right now citizen comments is item six in the agenda. It's two to three hours, um, you know, before people get a chance to speak. I know I'm probably more ornery than, than, than before when I'm sitting someplace for three to four hours. Uh, maybe moving citizen comments up to, to item three right after the announcements gives chance, you know, gives people a chance to get their cards in ahead of time. They don't have to sit here for two hours. Um, they can speak before decisions are made. It's not going to make our meetings any longer, um, but I think it can just, you know, maybe bring the temperature down a little bit. And, you know, quite frankly, I know um, we're all interested in Southern Estates, ninth edition. I, I don't imagine most of the people that are here to speak on other items are, and, and sitting there for two and a half hours, three hours sometimes to, to listen to that. So that would be my suggestion, um, and, and I think that there could be some value to that. I, I would suggest that if we're going to expand um, the time by 60%, that we shouldn't allow people to relinquish their time to someone else. It's you have five minutes, and that's your five minutes, and that's it. I would be okay going to four minutes and seeing how that goes, but I'm also okay with five minutes, and because we can always change the policy should we think five minutes becomes too long. I would guess most people aren't going to get up and speak for five minutes. So uh, is there, why don't we, why don't we move that concept forward? Um, if, is there a motion and a second to move citizen comments earlier in the agenda to limit it to five minutes? And should we have issues where um, we can't maintain control, we go into recess as, as policy? Is there agreement on that or, or additional comments? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Veen, comment? No, I, I okay. think that makes perfect sense. Okay, Mr. Weber? I, I have some additional questions first before yeah, I'm ready absolutely. to make that. I, so um, the, the sharing of time, I, I completely concur with that. That, that could get out of hand. Uh, so I would be uh, opposed to any, you know, uh, I, I, I relinquish my time kind of uh, options. Um, in addition to the time limit, um, I'd also want us to, to consider a, a limit on the uh, length of possible limit on the length of submitted comments. Um, you had mentioned the possibility of reading those comments. Uh, essentially, a double space page uh, read out loud is two minutes. So two double space pages would be uh, four minutes long, uh, or two and a half pages would be five minutes long. Um, I, I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of uh, moving citizen comments up in the agenda. I think that's a tremendous idea. I hadn't heard that before. Um, we haven't, maybe, maybe Mr. Quinn has uh, persuaded us not to look at this, but limits on who is uh, able to uh, discuss during, during citizen comments. Do we want to discuss that any further? Or are you advising us to not have such limits? Because some cities do, right? Uh, Council Member Weber, are you, as far as residency requirement, mm -hmm. is, that, is that what you're asking? Um, so I, in North Dakota, I haven't seen any of those. It's just federal, other federal courts have upheld them as constitutional. So in North Dakota, I don't, I don't remember seeing a residency requirement. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm willing to scrap that one for now, right? So the issues we have are um, no sharing of time, moving the, the citizen comments up on the agenda, um, limit on time, a possible limit on uh, uh, submitted comments, and a, uh, a policy about going into recess when there's disruptive behavior. Are we thinking of making them submit by noon on Monday, or can they still walk up and hand, hand you the piece of paper? I think we should, uh, I think that's probably, my personal opinion, that's probably a little restrictive, but I don't see any reason why we shouldn't require them to be turned in by the start of the meeting. And if you intend to come here, especially since we're moving public comment to the beginning of the meeting, people should be here in time for the meeting to start. So to me, that would make sense. Have them in, turned in by the time the on air comes on and, and then we're prepared to run the meeting appropriately. 
But again, that's just my opinion. Well, Mr. Sandy, one of the things in support of that, you would then know if the five minute is the maximum, about how much time would be maximum we'd have for public comment. That is true, and so we could let people know who are waiting to come and talk on other things, I suppose, or wit witness other items. Council President Sandy, yeah. maybe even if you could have a comment, there's been, because I've heard it, you know, to me also the comment is that, and the, the answers have been encouraged, and to some, why don't we answer? So I think if we're going to have an upfront comment, a lot of the agenda items are going to come later, and so it's, it, it really, as a staff member who already knows the answer, or it's been answered, you know, multiple times over, the comments come in, I think sometimes that confuses the public of why don't we answer the question that's been asked. So I, if it's going to be a truly a comment, I think we need to be really descriptive. This is a comment. It's not a, a, a Q and A session, so we make that abundantly clear up front and in advance of when citizens come up. This is a comment period, um, and maybe the whomever's directing the meeting can say, you know, this there will be a subject matter on this later that will be discussed. Otherwise, it, I think it leads to why aren't we answering? And certainly, we we have answers to that. So, if we could have a clear direction on what we're supposed to do on that, so we have consistency meeting to meeting too. Yep. Mr. Quinn, if someone wants to spend their four minutes, five minutes simply asking questions, that, that they would be free to do so. We can't restrict that, can we? We can decide whether we want to respond to the questions or not during citizen comment period, but can we restrict? Uh, Council Member Weber, you're, you're correct. If, if somebody wanted to stand up for their time and ask questions, um, during the comment period, citizen comment period, um, that would be permitted. Um, but the city council or mayor, city staff does not need to engage or answer those questions. In fact, I would, if people don't have comments but actually have questions that they want answered, I would encourage them, first of all, to reach out to us, uh, city administration, city council members, even the city attorney, I'm sure, would take an email or a phone call. Um, I would encourage people, if you have questions, to, to seek out to get them answered. If you are, um, if that is not a reasonable way for you to get your questions across, no reason why you can't come to the city council meeting and raise pertinent comments and questions. I, Mr. I, Weber, yes, sir. I wish we had a whiteboard because this is uh, there's a number of uh, issues that have come up, but I'll, I'll try to go through them as, as a checklist here. Um, first of all, limits on who um, can speak during citizen comments. I'm, I'm thinking we want to avoid that. And if, if someone wants to fly in from Ohio, they, they're, they're welcome to visit our community, and we hope they enjoy our restaurants and, and our lodging. Um, uh, uh, we don't want to allow any uh, sharing of time, is what I'm, I'm, I've heard so far. Um, there would be a length uh, limit on uh, five minutes for time or two and a half pages for submitted comments. Um, uh, disruptive signs, if there's any disruptive behavior, then uh, we would uh, go into recess. So there's, there's no need to have a policy on signs, I don't think. Um, and, but we, we do want to have uh, a, an explicit policy about uh, going into recess and that that means shutting down what we're, uh, what we're broadcasting when we're in recess and then coming back after recess. I believe those are the, the main points that have been discussed so far. Is there anything I'm missing there? Oh, I think, I think that's it. Um. Then uh, based on the five minutes, the two and a half pages, going into recess for uh, disruptive behavior um, and no sharing of time, and the movement of uh, citizen comments to um, uh, further up in the agenda, whether that's item three. Um, uh, based on those things, I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, uh, recommend to council next week for their consider for our consideration uh, that we uh, adopt those those policies. Is there a second to that? Second by Kavami. Further further discussion related to that motion and recommendation. Mr. Mr. Sandy, yes, um, Mr. Bean. One one quick question. Sometimes, you know, it's easy. It, it, 
making citizens' comments early has its benefits, but sometimes you may want to make comments based on an action at the end of the meeting, too. Um, I'm assuming we will just, for now, just make it up front, and we can maybe come back and think if that's successful or not. Well, any, uh, no, I, I think we're going to set the policy, but I, I think the council has discretion, but I think we're trying to make the policy so that we're on point, right? And that is one of the downfalls of moving the citizen comments earlier in the agenda is there could be something, as Mr. Veen points out, there could be something that comes up. I, I think on the positive side, moving it earlier in the agenda because people don't have to wait two to three hours for public comment, it may actually encourage more people to show up and provide public comments. Um, but uh, to the con contrary, the people that are coming for other agenda items who may want to have comment on them may miss the opportunity. So maybe we should stick to the end of, I, I think personally, uh, I, I like the concept until I actually put a little more thought to it. I think we should keep it at the end of the meeting personally. Mr. Gosted, did you have a comment? Yeah, just, my only comment is once you've uh, maybe uh, kind of adopted this policy here, what my thought process is our office would then actually create a bullet point so that the council would be aware of it, the presiding officer would be aware of it, and we'd have some maybe signage uh, as people are coming in so they know uh, and maybe even have it short enough that it could be part of an agenda every agenda uh, for meetings so people are aware of what, what the policies are for public comments. Right. If, if I could then. Mr. Weber? Um, I'd, I'd prefer to not modify the uh, motion at this time. Um, however, it's just a recommendation for council consideration next week. And that could be part of the, the ongoing uh, discussion next week after we see, uh, would, would you be able to take what we discussed tonight if there's, uh, if, if we pass this motion and uh, generate something for our consideration next week then? Yeah, Mr. Quinn's been talking all, but I've been taking all the notes. Okay. So I'm aware <laughs> of, uh, of what I think the guidance is here. Very good. So, so my preference would be to, uh, to keep that in as I originally stated it for now. Uh, so further comment. Thank you, Mr. Veen, for, for that comment. Mr. Mayor, yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know if there was a second or not, but, um, I think having at the beginning, at least you're hearing from people before the decision's made, I mean, and then after, you know, those action items go through, there would certainly be the opportunity to speak again and uh, before the next council meeting. And if council needed to make a, a decision based on, on that, they'd have that opportunity then. But I guess I'd rather hear before a decision's being made rather than after. Um, just seems to be more value to that, in my opinion. Right, if, if I may. The, the purpose of our meetings is for us to make decisions. Getting that input before we've made our decisions uh, seems to have a greater logic than waiting until after we've made our decisions and then being yelled at. Yes, but uh, to the contrary, most of those items have pub are public comment items anyway. So we're going to hear about the items first, and, and then we're going to open the public comment, and we're going to hear from people again on the same items. So I'm, I hear you. And I'm okay. Let's move. Let's think about it for next week. I think. I think I agree with you, Ms. Osowski, Did you have a comment? Or okay. Thank you. We um, could. Sorry. We could. Yes. We could try it. If it doesn't work, we can be yeah, right exactly. back here. And, and That's fix exactly it. right. So, we can always go. try it and see what happens. Mayhem may ensue. We'll see. Um, so uh, there's a motion and a second. Um, before we finish the item, I did want to bring up um, Facebook and comments on Facebook. Um, I know that, um, as I'd mentioned earlier, there have been significant, very nasty things said about uh, council members, uh, specific council members, and very specific things said on Facebook in the comments from many people that aren't members of our community. Um, because as most people know, uh, the corn milling plant has made national news thanks to uh, many different reasons and because of that people from all over the country are tuning in to our Facebook feed and have been making what I consider inappropriate comments up into actual physical threats of council members. I've been advocating for turning off the comments on Facebook because I don't think it's necessary and we have no obligation to provide an avenue for people in prison in Tennessee 
to say to ask for the addresses of the council members i don't think it, it's necessary for us to provide that avenue for people but i'm certainly open if there are other people on the council that think that the facebook comments should be live um i'm certainly open to hearing other people's opinions Mr. Kavami? you know i think there's lots of avenues for folks to post on social media so i don't think we're taking away anything if I'm looking at people posting right now you know there's still other plenty of opportunities for posts so if we can just keep it as a formal this is where you go to see you go somewhere else to make comments thank you mr kvami other comments or thoughts yeah mr weber um i i continue to hope that uh our due diligence on this plant um uh, generates the kind of positive data that it has to date and that we'll be able to move forward with this important economic development piece and this this growth opportunity for our community one of my greatest concerns is that we've gone beyond le legitimate debate to something else and that that uh, has the risk of eroding some of the confidence that city councils enjoyed uh, from the, the citizens of, of Grand Forks. We have this uh, on a survey uh, that was conducted a few years ago, um, showing 70% comp confidence from the, the citizens in, uh, in, in the city council. Um, and if a restriction on social media were to uh, erode that trust, that, that would be unfortunate. In fact, when Mr. Kavami started to say, there's plenty of opportunities for posting, I thought you were going to say, so we might as well have them post on our site uh, where we can uh, uh, monitor it more closely. In fact, I would hope that we might even develop a, a process for uh, monitoring that and responding to it instead of just letting it uh, happen in, in kind of a Wild West fashion that we... Uh, we provide some response to that, that no, we're not intentionally uh, monkeying with the communication systems, we just have a, a speaker with a bad microphone, that that, that kind of comment could be um, inserted in, in the, uh, the comments from others. Uh, I don't know about that, I, I, at this time, which way I, I'm really leaning, uh, but I'll, I'll say it again, we have one of the least restrictive set of policies in the state right now, and it pains me that we've been brought to this point where we're even having to have this discussion about uh, putting any restrictions on the process that we've enjoyed in the, the last uh, 10 plus years that I've been here, and we've not had any trouble with it. I would contend that we're actually becoming even less restrictive. We had a three minute policy, we're going to a five minute. We made everybody wait to the end of the meeting. We're bringing it up to the beginning of the meeting. Contrary to what my friend Tim is posting about me out on Facebook right now that I'm trying to limit people, I'm not. I'm having the conversation so that we can have as much public input in a reasonable and rational way as possible. Thanks for that reframe. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Mr. Phelan. I just, uh, you know, Council President Sandy, Vice President, wherever you, you have been around here a while, remember we're, we're in a community hall, and I think one, one thing that's unique is that we meet four times uh, a month. If you were in Fargo or if you were in Bismarck, they'd have a, a and again, they're commissions, but they'd have one meeting. They'd have two meetings a month, and they'd go everything to final conclusion. And so when we have our, our the equivalent of what they do is our city council meetings. They don't have a community of the whole meeting where there's a working meeting going through the items. They do meetings twice a month, just like, you know, on final approval. So I think you're doing the additional, having the working session um, that you guys are leading. And, and as you recall, I'm, I'm going to say like 2014 or 16, you used to have two committees. You had finance, development, service, safety. Um, a previous city council combined it into a committee of the whole. They still wanted a committee meeting. They just wanted to integrate them into one large group so everybody heard everything at the same time. So I think you're doing, you're going above and beyond what other communities do where they just have, they go one meeting and it's one and done. I think the other thing is we've never, as part of the um, committee meetings or the committee of the whole meetings, we've never allowed like a citizen comment period so you should probably think about that you know the agendas have been pretty um, standard for several years and so right now 
at your community hall. It, it is a working meeting to for staff and you to work through the details before you make a recommendation. Get them. So right now we wouldn't plan to put any comment on these committee of the whole meetings, unless you say you want them. They're your meetings. F further comments related to the Facebook. I, I would vote for turning the comments off. Yeah. I think they're they're very inappropriate and. And un unnecessary. And, and they're not again. positive. They're not good for anything. Right. Thank you. So uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any other comments or questions related to the motion? Mr. Gosted, you have everything you need, sir? I do. Thank you. And you'll be prepared for Monday night next week? We will. Appreciate that. I will not be here Monday night next week, so everybody knows I'm working that night. Um, there's a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Motion carries unanimously. So uh, that's last but not least. Is there an, a motion to adjourn by Weber, second by Weigel? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>